With every generation, the church has to address problems in both belief and behavior. Many, if not all, of deviant doctrine is simply old teaching that has been refitted for a new generation. And one of the ever-present instincts within Christianity is the draw to the law. One of the things that Galatians has exposed for us in our study of this significant book, is that at heart, every single one of us are legalistic. Thus the appeal, the draw towards the law. Now, there are many believers in the past and the present who believe that the New Testament believers must place themselves under Old Testament law. Many believers today believe New Testament believers, that they must place themselves under the laws and regulations of the Old Testament. I gave my grandma a hard time about, oh, a decade and a half ago because she had a stint in Messianic Judaism for a season. I don't know why, but she did, where she was a Messianic Christian, or a Messianic, she was attending both a Baptist church and a Messianic Jewish church, which is Jewish but Christian, if that makes any sense. And so we all gave her a hard time for a while. And, uh, and, and basically the, the idea there is you're, you're still doing all of the Jewish things, but you're doing it in a Christian way, if that makes sense. One of the, one of the major issues, again, that, that Christians deal with is this nature of what, what is our relationship to the law? Are we responsible to Old Testament law? And that's one of the major issues that Paul deals with in this letter to the Galatians. That's one of the reasons why he writes this letter to begin with. And that's exactly what we're going to look at today in our passage, Galatians 3, 10 through 14. So so you have your Bibles open there. Follow along with me in your copy of Scripture. And again, that's going to be on page 914 if you you need a seat Bible. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 14. Paul writes this. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll take apart these verses and see what is there for us. Let's pray. Father, as we approach these verses and and consider the truths that you have for us, truths that may be difficult for us to understand or comprehend, we acknowledge that we need your help. We need you to make your word clear. We need you to make your word plain. So, Father, we ask for your help this morning as we study that you would reveal the meaning of this passage to us, that you would make it crystal clear and understandable. That for those here this morning that perhaps struggle right now, we ask that you'd be with them. For those who are doubting that the word would make clear to them, for those who really wrestle with this whole idea of what do we do with the law, Father, we know your word is sufficient and you answer it for us this morning. So we ask for encouragement for hurting hearts. We ask for clarity for wandering minds. And we ask that you'd keep the messenger out of the way of the message. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, Galatians 3 contains the essence of Paul's argument against the false gospel propagated by the legalistic Judaizers. These Judaizers had infiltrated the churches in the cities across Galatia with a message of legalism and with a false gospel. They were teaching that in order to be truly part of God's people, you had to place yourself under the Mosaic law. That meant that you had to follow Jewish diet laws. You had to follow Follish. Follow, I'm, I'm combining follow and Jewish. You had to follow Jewish dress laws and you had to observe Jewish feasts and Jewish festivals. 
And of course, most prominently, and what we see again and again here in Galatians, is that they believed that you had to be circumcised. Because you'll remember in the Old Testament, circumcision was the physical identifying mark that you were part of the nation of Israel. Now, here's the problem. The Galatian Christians had bought into the lie. They had been bewitched by this false doctrine. And so the Apostle Paul goes on the attack. And as we've worked through this chapter, we've seen the logic of Paul's argumentation. In verse 1 through 5, Paul argued from experience. And here, the reasoning goes like this. Only Christians have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. You have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you are a true Christian. Circumcision didn't save you. Neither did following any of the works of the law. How do you know that? Because you have the Spirit. The indwelling Spirit is proof that you're saved. And you receive that Spirit by faith. That's Galatians 3, 1 through 5. Then in verses 6 through 9, Paul moves on to an argument from Scripture. He says, Abraham was saved by faith. To be a Christian is to be one who is saved by faith, not works. So if you are a Christian, you are a child of Abraham because like him, you were saved by faith. Now that's the summary of what we've studied thus far in this critical chapter of Galatians. Now Paul is going to move on from describing those who are of faith and start to describe those who are under the law. His argument really is going to center on what the law accomplishes. So let's begin in verse 10 through 11, where we will see the teaching of the penalty of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So our passage this morning begins with a clear contrast. And when arguing, when trying to make a point, one of the best ways to clarify what you're saying is to make a contrast. And that's what Paul does here. Up to this point, Paul has been talking about those who are of faith. And now he shifts to those who are under the law. Because remember the audience he's talking to. They are those who believed that they had to place themselves under the law. New Testament Christians, but they bought into the lie that they are, they are responsible and under the regulations of the Old Testament. So basically what Paul is going to do is, is, is he's asking this question. Okay, those of you who want to be under the law, those of you who want to place yourselves under Old Testament law, what does that mean for you? You so badly want to put yourself under those regulations of Old Testament law. What does that look like? What does that mean? That's what he's talking about here. And that's why he says, beginning, look down at your Bibles at verse 10. He says, for all those who rely on the law, you rely on the works of the law. What is that? What is in store for those who, who are relying on the works of the law. What is in store for those people who are subjugating themselves to Old Testament law? What does he say? Look at it again, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are what? They're under a curse. They are under a curse. Why is that? Well, Paul anticipates that you're going to ask that question, and so he quotes Deuteronomy 22 or 27, 26. And that's, if you have the ESV in front of you, you'll notice there's quotation marks there. He's quoting Deuteronomy 27, 26, which says this, Paul, or cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. So Paul is saying that if you're relying on your obedience to the law for your relationship with God, you are going to find yourself in a curse, under a curse. So you had these Judaizers who were saying, you got to, if you want to be truly Christian, if you want to be truly part of God's people, you have to place yourselves under the law. And Paul's saying, if you're placing yourself under the law, if you're relying on the law, defining your relationship with Jesus through the law, the only thing that you're going to find for yourself is not blessing, it's not even relationship. You're going to find yourself simply under a curse. 
Katara is the word, which means curse or imprecata- um, imprecation, like, like an imprecatory prayer. Those, those, those psalms, there's, there's, in the book of Psalms, you have all these imprecatory psalms. And those are those, those psalms where, where the psalmist is praying for damnation and judgment on his enemies. Okay, that's the, I don't know if you've prayed those prayers. It's okay if you have. I've prayed those prayers. I'll be honest with you. Absolutely, I have. No doubt about it. Um, <laughs> because I didn't act out on that, right? You pray to God. You're appealing to God to, to work out justice. So you don't you know, go all vigilante and think you can do it yourself. So anyways, Katara, it's this idea of, of being cursed, of being damned. And the idea really specifically is you are condemned. You're condemned by God. So what Paul is saying here is if, if you're looking and relying upon the law, if you're placing yourself under God's law, you are only going to find yourself condemned by God. That's it. That's all the law will bring for you. Condemnation. And again, just to clarify things, when, we, when, we, when we're reading through scripture and we use that word law, we're not referring to, like in our country, laws and regulations, you know, going the speed limit. You know, this morning, um, I took, I, the speed limit over here is like, what, 50? I don't know, 45. I rode with Shreya this morning. She was my driver. She was going faster. She broke the law this morning. Okay. We're not saying that. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about are those specific regulations in the Old Testament. Think Exodus 20 on. Think the book of Leviticus. All of those regulations like don't eat pork, don't eat shrimp, don't wear polyester, don't get a tattoo, all of those, that's what we're talking about. When we refer to the law, we're talking about the law of Moses or the Mosaic law, those laws that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. All right? That's what we mean. And so Paul's saying, if, if you are looking to place yourself under those laws, under those regulations, you're only going to find condemnation. And this, of course, was Paul's own experience. He tells us this. In Galatians chapter 2, 17 through 19, which we covered a few months ago, he says, If in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law. And then in Romans 7, verse 7 through 11, he says, What shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So understand here how self-defeating it is for people to place themselves under God's law, thinking that that's going to be the grounds of their relationship with him. Because according to Paul, the only thing that the law does for you is it brings condemnation. The very commandment that promised life to me proved to be death to me. Okay, if you if you want to try that out, try it out, try it out, right? Try to live a life of obedience. Go ahead. Try to follow God's commandments. You're gonna do okay, but ultimately you're gonna fail. Okay? So if you're thinking that your grounding before God is based upon your obedience. It's gonna, you're going to be saying the exact same thing Paul said. What I thought was life, it just brings death. It just brings guilt. It just brings shame. James put it this way in James 2, 8 through 13. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, then he gives us an example. You shall love your neighbors yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So here, here's, what, here's what James says, and it's what Paul is saying here in Galatians 3.10. If you're looking to the law as the grounds before, of your standing before God, you had better obey all of it. You had better not break a single law, because according to James, if you break even one law, you're guilty of it all. You're guilty of all of the law. So, if you're looking to your obedience to the laws, you're standing before God. If that's what you're relying on, if that's what you're counting on, you're cursed. You're condemned. Why? Because if you've broken even one of God's laws, you're guilty of the entire law. You might as well have broken them all. What God demands is nothing less than perfection. Verse 11. Now it is evident, Paul says, that no one is justified before God by the law. For, then look what he quotes, the righteous shall live by faith. In verse 11, Paul draws what should be at this point an obvious conclusion. He says, this is evident. Delos is the word. Clear, plain, evident. What's clear? What's plain? What's evident? Here it is. What's so obvious No one is justified, no one is declared right before God by the law. That's what we've been seeing again and again in this book, isn't it? We aren't saved by the works of the law. We aren't saved by our obedience to the law. You you can't. You can't obey the law. You cannot do it. But salvation by obedience, salvation by being a good person, that's what religions teach. That's what all religions teach. You're saved by what you do. You're saved by your good deeds. You're saved if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Every religion in the world, at its heart, teaches this. Biblical Christianity alone goes against the grain of religion. Biblical Christianity teaches what the Bible says. You're saved not by your good deeds. You're saved not by your good works. You're saved by faith alone. And from your new heart, then, will flow good deeds. So good deeds flow from you, but good deeds don't save you. Good deeds are the proof of a saved heart. We're saved not by works, but by faith. Paul has already expressed this in Galatians chapter 2, 15 through 16. He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have also believed in Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So, so here's the situation. And you see how contradictory this is for the Galatians to have believed the lie that they're saved by the works of the law. Paul is saying you can't be saved by the works of the law because, number one, uh, you, it's impossible to keep. Like, if you think that your track is to be saved by the works of the law, okay, sure, that's fine, but you got to be perfect. What God demands is perfection. So you better obey all of the laws and not break a single one of them. Well, to be truthful, I mean, that's not realistic. No, no one's in that condition. So, so you either be perfect or you place your faith in Jesus. Okay, those are the options. Perfection or faith in Christ. And of course, this one isn't a possibility, perfection. So what does that leave for us? Either condemnation or faith in Jesus. Placing your faith in Christ. Paul's going to go on in chapter 3 to state what we've been covering these past few weeks, that we receive the Spirit by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. Therefore, you and I are saved by faith. I mean, this is so clear. It's so evident. It's so plain that we're saved by faith, not by works. But Paul, being the great biblicist that he is, is not content to just state truth. He wants to prove truth with Scripture. Okay, and, and, and likewise, we do the same. We don't just say, this is you know, what I believe. It's what does the Bible say? And, and so Paul quotes the Bible. Now, in verse 10, he quoted from Deut- Deuteronomy. Here in verse 11, he quotes from the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. We read this. His soul is puffed up and is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Isn't that amazing? The consistent teaching of the Old Testament has always been that we're saved not by works, but by faith. Last time we saw in the first book of the Bible that Abraham was justified by faith. 
And now we're seeing the same teaching that the righteous live not by works, but by faith. God's people are truly God's people, not by works, but by faith in Christ. Now, Paul could have gone to a whole host of places to make that point, but he draws that point, he draws that conclusion from the book of Habakkuk. And some of you didn't even know that in your Bible, there was a book called Habakkuk. But Habakkuk demonstrates salvation is by faith alone. Paul demonstrates that what he's teaching is not novel teaching. This isn't some new innovation. He didn't come up with it. This has been the message from the very beginning. This has been the message throughout all of the Old Testament. The law, the prophets, the writings, all of the Old Testament is clear that salvation is not by works. Salvation is by faith. Now, in verse 12, Paul's going to further spell out the clear and plain conclusions from this truth. And we're going to be spending, we're going to park here because this is very complicated, all right? So look at verse 12. The law is not a faith. Rather, and in this quotation, the one who does them shall live by them. Now, this phrase, the law is not faith, has perplexed Bible interpreters. The commentaries I consulted this week ran on for pages and pages and pages on this verse. And there are an abundance of false teachings at this point. So, so you'll hear individuals, Christians, who say, I have no relationship whatsoever to the Old Testament. None of it appeals to me. None of it applies to me. Why? Because the law is not a faith. So, so, so that's Old Testament. I'm New Testament. I can do whatever I want, live however I want. I have no relation to the law. In fact, I'm against the law. Okay, I'm, I'm anti-law. Uh, Andy Stanley uh, famously a couple years ago said that we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Um, and, and he's gone even further than that. And he's, gone, he's even landed now here just this Easter recently was talking about how we don't believe in, in the resurrection from the Bible. The Bible's irrelevant. We believe in the resurrection because we believe in Jesus. Now, of course, how does that work when our only understanding of the resurrection and account of the resurrection is from the Bible? I don't know, but that's for him to work out. Okay, so, so that's where he's at now. But the idea here is you have many people who say, oh, we don't, we don't need any of that. It, we're of faith. We're not of the law. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Now, one of the complicated aspects of the Christian life is the Christian's relationship to the Old Testament law. So earlier, you heard me talk about some of those Old Testament laws. Old Testament law prohibits followers of God or God's people to eat shrimp, to eat pig, to eat bacon. I like bacon. I eat shrimp, not a big deal, right? Uh, some of the Old Testament regulations is you're not supposed to wear polyester. I, I am wearing polyester right now. Um, we mentioned one of those Old Testament commandments that you're not supposed to get a tattoo. If you were an Old Testament Jew and you walked in this morning, you would see that our lead male vocalist on the stage has a tattoo. Don't all look at him, but it's, it's, it's true. It's true. He does. My wife has a tattoo right here, and it says, Sola Fide, faith alone. Now, when I first met her and I saw that, did I say, you degenerate? We need to take you out back and stone you? Okay. No, I didn't. I didn't. All right? So, so, so in some way, then, we're in New Testament Christianity, we see that Christians have come to the understanding that we're not under those laws, right? We're not. However, and that's true, that's true. There are, there are, there are laws that don't apply anymore to you and I. But it's also true that when Jesus is talking about in, in the great Sermon on the Mount, and when he's explaining life in the kingdom, he says, you have heard it said, and then he'll quote from the Old Testament law. Like, you shall not commit adultery, for instance. You've heard this to be true. And then what Jesus does is he doesn't say, ah, disregard that, unhitch from that. He actually takes Old Testament law and he goes further. He says, you've heard it been taught, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with them. So there's elements where, where Christians understand we're not under Old Testament law. 
And there are other aspects where we are not only under Old Testament law, but we're under expanded Old Testament law. So the Christian is simultaneously under the law and not under the law. And and you say, okay, that's really confusing and that's a complicated issue. Well, you're not not alone in your expression of that. One of the greatest theologians in church history, Jonathan Edwards, expressed it well, saying this. This is Edwards now. Um, Edwards, even even from secularists, even from non-Christians, Jonathan Edwards is considered to be the greatest philosophy, philosopher in American history. So philosopher, theologian, one of the greatest minds in, in all of Christian history right here, Jonathan Edwards. And this is what he writes. There is perhaps no part of divinity or theology, there is perhaps no part of divinity attended with so much intricacy and wherein orthodox divines, orthodox theologians, do so much differ as the stating, the precise agreement and difference between the two dispensations of Moses and Christ. What Edwards is saying, dispensation is just a dispensation is just like a system of government. It's a period of time. So what, what Edwards is saying is that there is no other issue in all of theology that you're going to need so much precise language and where two solid Christian theologians will differ than the issue of the law. The issue of the time of Christ and the time of Moses. And, and, and this, is, this is true. This is true. Um, I am unapologetically a Baptist, right? Now, that, that includes a lot of different things, but basically the, the idea of being a Baptist, what really set them apart during the time of the Reformation was they believe that what the Bible teaches that you are saved um, and then you are baptized, right? You are, your baptism is a public identifying mark of your inner union with Christ. Now, <clears throat> part, of, part of this, this whole intricacies, if you, if you take me as a Baptist and you put me with a bunch of Presbyterians, we're going to have a very different understanding of our relationship to the law, our relationship to the Old Testament, all right? Now, let's get this even down even more further, and, and I'm going to say something that you're going to say, what on earth are you even talking about? In my understanding of hermeneutics and my understanding of the Old and New Testaments, I would be called what is, I would be what is called a progressive dispensationalist. Okay, that's, that's where I'm at in my understanding of things. That's going to be different than someone who is covenant in their theology. A lot of Presbyterians, most Presbyterians, pretty much all of them covenant in their theology. So, so you could have, for instance, John MacArthur, who is a dispensationalist Baptist, and R.C. Sproul, who is a covenantal Presbyterian, and on the issue of the law, they're going to be arguing different things. See, that? that's what Edwards is saying here. Both are solid. Both are reliable Bible teachers. I would recommend both of their sermons and their books to you without reservation. But when it comes to our relationship to the Old Testament law, they're going to arrive on different sides of the equation. That's what Edwards is saying. Otherwise, solid, um, the, so he says that there's, there's differences between Orthodox divines, Orthodox theologians at this point. What is our relationship to Old Testament law. Now, we've been filling that tension between the period of Moses and the period of Christ, between the period of the Old Testament and the period of the New Testament. And and that's why this letter to the Galatians is so significant for helping us to understand how we, as members of the New Covenant, relate to members of the Old Covenant or, or how we relate to the Mosaic Law. What makes this issue so complicated is the Bible teaches that we are on the one hand not under the law and simultaneously, on the other hand, are under the law. And we don't have time to address in specifics what that means, not being under the law and under the law, but we will come to an understanding of that issue the the more we study Galatians, okay? So we're just dipping our toes in it. It will will become more clear as we work through this letter. This is, in fact, one of the reasons why this letter is in the New Testament. So let's just boil down the discussion down to what Paul identifies here in verse 12, that the law is not a faith. Now, 
This phrase is not as complicated as it may initially seem. In fact, the meaning is, is, is fairly straight, straightforward and fairly simple. Paul says, when he says that the law is not of faith, he's saying that the law and faith are exclusive. They don't go together. The law is not a faith. They're, they're not hand in hand. They exclude each other. Now, we need to be very careful. This is why we're being precise. So I told you to get some coffee. What we're not saying is that the law and faith are opposed to each other in your sanctification, in your becoming more like Jesus. That's what we're not saying. In fact, in the realm of your sanctification, faith and law, they go together. Okay? What we are saying, and this is where we need to draw the distinction, in regards to salvation, in regards to your becoming a Christian at all, faith and law are opposed to each other. They don't go hand in hand. The law is not a faith. When it comes to a, a, a becoming a Christian, becoming a believer, you're either looking to the law and your obedience to it as the grounds for your justification, or you're looking to Christ in faith and what he has done as the grounds of your justification. You can't go on both roads. You've got to pick a path. You're either saved by your works, your obedience to the law, or you're saved by faith. That's it. So when it comes to your salvation, you're only going to either go by law or by faith. And remember, law demands perfection. So here, here's what we're getting at here. You're saved by faith alone. You cannot be saved by your works and faith. That's religion. That's what Catholicism and Mormonism advocate. Catholics, you're saved by your faith and your works. Mormons say you're saved by your faith after you, after you, God, God will save you by grace after you do everything that you can do is literally what, what they say, all right? So, so, that, so that's religion. We're not, that's not what we're advocating. We're advocate, advocating salvation by faith alone. Now, Paul says in verse 12 that the law is not a faith. If you're looking to the law and good works for salvation, you're not looking to faith. And you're going to find yourself, verse 10, condemned. If you're looking to faith in Jesus for salvation, you're not looking at the law and good works. You're looking to Christ. So on the question of salvation, law and faith do not go together. The law is not a faith. Now, now that's complicated. Some of you already, I lost you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> you just got to get more coffee. Okay, now that's complicated. It's about to get even more complicated. So get, get another shot of caffeine, because look what Paul does next. He, he quotes Leviticus 18.5 to prove his point. Now, now I'm going to read Leviticus 18.5. Listen to this. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So, so Paul says, the law is not of faith. And then he quotes Leviticus 18.5, which says that you need to obey the law. And you say, well, wait a second. Doesn't that actually disprove what Paul just said? If in Leviticus 18, God is saying that we live by keeping his statutes and rules, doesn't that disprove what Paul is saying in Galatians, that we're saved and live by faith, not by the law? Very complicated. Now you're starting to see why Edward says that the relationship between the believer and the law needs to be attended to with intricacy. It's a nuanced Thing. It takes a lot of mental work and a lot of working out to get this done. So what is Paul saying here when he says that the law is not of faith, and then he quotes Leviticus 18.5, which says that you need to follow the law to live? There's an illustration for us in the Gospels that is really going to provide clarity. Okay, Right now you're confused. Right now the water is murky. You're cloudy. What is he saying? There's an illustration in the scripture that's going to help us out. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We're going to get some help from Jesus at this point. Luke chapter 10. And we'll begin reading at verse 25. Okay, so here's the situation. Here's the tension. Paul's saying the law and faith don't go together. Then he quotes Leviticus 18.5, which says, if you want to live, you got to obey the law. Okay. So, so we're, what we're trying to wrestle with here is, is this a contradiction? Is Paul speaking doublespeak here? Jesus also is going to quote Leviticus 18.5. 
in this text that we're about to look at, and this is going to help us to understand, okay? Luke chapter 10, starting off in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer, now understand this is not like, we're not talking like Saul Goodman here. We're not talking like a, like a legal expert. We're talking about when the Bible refers to lawyers, it's in reference to, to experts in Old Testament law. Okay, so you have here an Old Testament scholar. Behold, a lawyer stood up to him, to Jesus, to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Look what Jesus says next, verse 26. And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? The Old Testament scholar answered him, verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, Jesus' response. You have answered correctly. Then he quotes Leviticus 18.5, which Paul does in Galatians 3.12. Do this, and you shall live. So here's your situation. Old Testament scholar comes up to Jesus. Hey, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you tell me. You're the, you're the expert in the law. What does the law say? Old Testament scholar says, well, you're to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, okay, do that, and you'll live. Do that, and you'll live. If you do that, you're going to go to heaven. That's how you enter eternal life. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do that and you will live. Obey that and you will live. Jesus is saying to him, do all of the Old Testament law and you will go to heaven. Fully obey every commandment of the law and you will go to heaven. Now there are some by some Jewish scholars, some 242 positive commands in, Old, in the Old Testament law and some 365 prohibitions in the Old Testament law. So do this 242 times or 242, 242 different regulations of what you're supposed to do and 365 different regulations of what you're not supposed to do. All right? So Jesus tells this guy, you do all 242 and you don't do all 365, you're going to go to heaven you'll have eternal life. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's demanding nothing less than perfection. Now, it's impossible to do this. It is impossible to be perfect. It's impossible to keep the Old Testament law. Forget about the 600 commands. Just take 10, the 10 commandments. Don't lie. Guilty, everyone in this room. Don't steal. All of you are guilty. Don't take God's name in vain. We're all guilty, regardless if you curse or not. Okay, it's broader than just cursing. Don't commit adultery. Every single person, well, maybe not, but mostly every single one in this room is guilty. If you hit puberty, guilty. Because that's what it's all about, right? When you hit puberty, you start to take notice of them. Guilty, you lust. Guilty, guilty, guilty. So Jesus says, Jesus says to this someone, um, this is a grown man challenging Jesus here. There's no doubt that he's lost it. So Jesus says, okay, yeah, sure. You want to go to heaven? Obey, all, obey everything. Look at verse 29. What's the response of the Old Testament scholar? But he, look what it says, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This man is feeling conviction. He's trying to justify himself. And so he asks Jesus, okay, well, who then is my neighbor? He knows he's deficient. He knows in his heart, he is not loving towards his neighbor. He knows he is deficient in those laws. The point is that Jesus exposes his heart. This guy's not compassionate. This guy doesn't love his neighbor. Despite his best attempts, he has not fully obeyed the law. He has not reached perfection. If he was looking to the Old Testament law to save him, he was looking in the wrong place because the law doesn't save, the law exposes. The law exposes. It's God demands perfection. The law shows us we're not perfect. And, and, it's, and it's a, it's, you just try it, and it will reveal to you you're not perfect. Now turn back to Galatians 3. Galatians 3. This is the point that Paul is making in verse 12. You're saved by what you look to. 
If you look to the law for your salvation, you had better keep it perfectly, all of it. And if you've already broken even one of it, one law, you're guilty of it all and you're condemned. That's what Paul's saying. So we can, now that we come to understand what he is saying, we need to clarify something. And I want to clarify this because it will help us from falling into a trap that, many, that so many are in regards to Old Testament law. What we need to understand is that the Old Testament law was given in the context of the nation state of Israel. That's critical. That is so important to understand. Up until Saul's appointment as the king of Israel, Israel was a theocracy. Like God was literally their king. That, that stops when Saul becomes the king, right? But the nation of Israel is set up not like our country, where we have a president, we have a Congress that's comprised of a House of Representatives and a Senate, and then over here you have, a, you have the, the Supreme Court, right? Where you have three branches of government as a head. No, 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 no. Old Testament Israel, it was founded. God is king. He is the king of the nation. That's, that, that basically breaks when Saul becomes king, All right? But originally, Israel's a theocracy, God is the literal king of the nation. And as such, God as king was in a covenant relationship with this nation. The covenant took a form of an obedience. The covenant is just an agreement. It's a contract. The Mosaic covenant was a suzerain vassal treaty, right? What that means is you have have in the Old Testament times, and, and this was actually carried on uh, really up until the medieval era where you have a king and that king will conquer a nation or conquer a people. And here's the agreement. You give me your resources, I'll give you protection, right? This is, this is what happened again and again. Nation conquered nation. And they said, you give me so much money, you give me so much resources, and we will protect you with our army from other, from other invasions. That's what's going on here. I mean, it's no coincidence that following their exodus from Egypt, the people of Israel, who are just a bunch of slaves, as they're constituted as a nation, God offers the Mosaic law. I will be my king. I will be your God. You will be my what? You'll be my people. I will protect you. I will bless you. I mean, Deuteronomy 27, first part, all of the covenant blessings. The second part, all of the covenant punishments. God says, I will bless you. I will protect you. I'll give you a land. But if you disobey me, you're going to be conquered. I'm going to withhold my blessing from you, and you will not have this land, right? It's it's that kind of relationship with the nation state of Israel. They obey God. God protects them. So how does Leviticus 18.5 play into this? Well, in the original context, it's the Mosaic law. If as a nation you want to live, meaning have God's blessing and have God's protection as a literal nation, what do you do? You obey his commandments. If you as a nation want to be blessed and you don't want to be conquered by the other nations, obey me. Obey me. And as you read through the Old Testament... Is this what happens? Do the people of Israel obey God? Yes and no. And what happens when they disobey God? They get conquered, right? They get conquered by everybody. That's the nation, or that's the, that's the nature of the Old Testament covenant. And you really need to understand that. It's critical to understand that. One of my Old Testament professors in seminary, Ken Casillas, wrote a little book addressing the issue of the law and the Christian, and it's called The Law and the Christian. (laughs) So I I would recommend this to you. Um, It's a little book. It's easy to understand. If you have trouble understanding the Christian's relationship to the law, read this little 70-page book, The Law. And look at the font. I mean, it's not even that big or not even that small. The Law and the Christian. You can knock this thing out in an afternoon. Ken Casillas. And in in this book, while commenting in our passage, here's what Cassius writes. Paul's point is that the Paul's point is that the Mosaic covenant emphasized doing. You had to obey in order to stay in the covenant and perhaps even to survive at all. The covenant was heavily contingent on human obedience. And this differs from a relationship based on faith alone. 
So the Mosaic law applied to the nation state of Israel. Obedience to the law meant protection and blessing. Disobedience to the law meant Israel would be conquered and punished. By the time we get to Paul's writings of of Galatians, here's the problem. The Jews fundamentally misunderstood the purpose of the law. Instead of seeing it as, as the law as, the, as being specific to the nation state of Israel, they were looking to the law and their obedience as the grounds of their salvation. But as we've already seen, that was a misunderstanding because even then, even in the covenant state, even in the Old Testament, salvation was never by works of the law. It was always by faith. That's why Paul goes back to Abraham, which is pre-Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was specifically for the nation state of Israel to protect them and bless them. It had nothing to do with inner heart condition of salvation. That was the trap they fell into. And this is why Paul makes the point that he does in verse 12. When it comes to salvation and when it comes to faith, Law and faith are exclusive. They don't go together. They cannot go together. If you're looking to the law, you had better be perfect, which we all understand is impossible. Since it's impossible then, you had better be looking to Jesus and be having your faith in him as the grounds of your salvation. You see that? That's the point here. That's what verse 12 is all about. So in verses 10 through 12, we see clearly that reliance on the law for salvation brings condemnation. And were we to stop here, this would leave us feeling heavy and hopeless. But fortunately, it's right here in our despair and darkness that the beauty of the gospel shines through. Look at verse 13 through 14, where we see the payment that Christ offers. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree. The language of verse 13 is the language of slavery, and it's the language of redemption. This word here, redeemed, is the word exagurazo, which means to deliver, to liberate, literally to buy off. Here's the picture. You and I were condemned. We were enslaved. We were enslaved to sin. We were without hope. And then Jesus bought us. Jesus liberated us. He purchased us as his slave. This is how the New Testament talks about, talks about us as our identity. We are slaves of Jesus. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. Or 1 Corinthians 7.23. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. Of course, in Romans 6, we read so clearly that you're either a slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. Everyone's a slave. It's not a question of if you're a slave or free. Every person on this planet is a slave. It's just a question of to whom or what are you enslaved. You're either enslaved to sin or you're enslaved to Jesus. Those are your options. And Jesus is the good master. And in him, in slavery to Jesus, there's true freedom. And what was the price of our redemption? What did Jesus pay to free us from slavery to sin? The price of our redemption was his blood. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Now look again at verse 13. Paul says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law or the condemnation of of the law by becoming a curse for us, by becoming condemned for us. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23, which reads this. If a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. As we saw earlier, to be cursed is to be condemned, to be condemned by God. Being hung on a tree does not make you cursed or condemned. It reveals that you are cursed or condemned. In ancient times, bodies were publicly displayed as a deterrent to lawbreaking. Following capital punishment, the Jews were commanded, you know, after they execute someone by stoning or whatever, they hang the body up on a tree. Why? Why? So that way, when you're walking along and you see a dead body on the tree, you say, what did that guy do? And it's, well, he did this. Okay, so survival instinct kicks in. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be my dead body on the tree. So 
maybe I won't do that, right? It, it, public execution is a deterrent. That's what's going on here. And by the time of the New Testament, the Romans really capitalized on this. And what would the Romans do when they conquered a city? You either, here's your options if you're conquered by the Romans. You could, if it's a good day, you become a vassal of the Roman Empire and they pretty much leave you alone, but they take all your money and your women. Okay, that's an option. Here's another option. Um, if you're a woman, you're probably going to get raped and impregnated and sold off to, be, uh, to, pleasure, to pleasure and serve the Romans. All right? If you're a man, it's not, that's not looking so good for you. They're going to they're gonna take you and they're going to put you on a cross and hang you outside the city. So that way, anyone who comes along says, oh, this is the power of Rome. What is it? Hundreds of people lining the highway, dying on a cross. Right? That, that's what's going on here. So it's a deterrent. And the New Testament often describes the cross of Christ as a tree. Acts 5.30, hung him on a tree. Acts 13.29, they took him from the tree. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore his body, bore our sins in his body on the tree. So what Paul is saying here is that Jesus redeemed us from the curse. He, played, he paid the blood price for, for, for us. The blood price was his becoming condemned for us. Where did he become condemned? He became condemned on the cross. That's what he's saying here. The the evidence of his condemnation was there. He was hung on a tree. He was hung on a cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What, What Paul's saying here is that Jesus was our substitute. He took our place. Now, 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 this is gospel liberation here. Because remember, the whole thing is, what is the relationship that we have towards the law? And remember, we've, we've really tried to drive home this point this morning. If you're looking to the law, if you're looking to your obedience to the commandments, you're not going to find blessing. You're going to find condemnation. Our only hope then, and all of us are condemned. I mean, that's clear. Our only hope then is if we're cursed, if we're condemned, we need someone else. We need Jesus. And Paul tells us, and that's the beauty of this, is that Jesus became the curse for us. Jesus was condemned for us. Jesus took our place. He was our substitute. That's what the cross is all about. He died for us. He took God's wrath for us. He became a curse for us. He became sin for us. Now, this is gospel liberation. So often as believers, we feel the crushing weight of our sin. We feel the crushing weight of our guilt. We are paralyzed by our anxiety. We sin again and again and again. And we feel that not only is God disappointed in us, but like he's going to rain down punishment on us, right? Like you feel that when you sin, you feel like we have this this distorted view of God and you feel like God's just like waiting for us to screw up before he just comes down on us. Like that's what we think, right? If we're honest, many of us. And when you feel that way, You have to run to the cross. You must see Jesus taking your place. You must see Jesus bearing all of God's wrath reserved for you, his becoming sin for you, his becoming a curse for you. You're all familiar with Martin Luther's story, The Great Reformer. Luther had a very sensitive conscience. He was tormented and afflicted by an unhealthy introspection. Luther lived inside of his head. He was all too painfully aware of his own shortcomings. You remember when he, was, when he was a good Catholic monk, he drove his mentor crazy because he would go to confess sin, he'd leave the confessional, and as he's leaving the confessional, he would have a dirty thought, he'd turn around and go right back in. And there were times, according to, according to legend, according to church tradition, that Luther would literally spend all day in the confessional, confessing his sin to the priest. And it got to the point where the priest got, literally, this is what happened. It got to the point where the priest was so sick of hearing Luther go on and on that he said, you know what? Maybe this isn't for you. Why don't you go teach the Bible at this university? He kicked him out of the monastery, and Luther went to go teach the Bible. And while teaching the book of Romans, Luther was like, wait a second. The church isn't like actually what the Bible says. Boom, Protestant Reformation, Okay. All of it from Luther's unhealthy conscience. So, so what I'm trying to get here is that Luther, like you think your conscience is sensitive. You think that you're, you have anxiety. I'm not denying that. But what I'm saying is Luther probably had more. And what did Luther look to, to, to calm his conscience, calm his anxiety? He looked to Jesus Christ and him crucified. He gives us this advice in his lectures on Galatians. 
this feeling of despair, anxiety, guilt. He says, battle against that feeling and say, even though I feel myself completely crushed and swallowed by sin and see God as hostile and a wrathful judge, yet in the fact this is not true, it is only my feeling that thinks so. The word of God, which I ought to follow in these anxieties rather than my own consciousness, teaches me much different, namely, that God is near to the brokenhearted, that God saves the crushed in spirit, that he does not despise a broken and contrite heart. So like Luther, we must place our hope on the cross of Christ. He's not looking to punish. If you've been in life group just this past week, we discussed the strange and, the strange and natural work of God, remember? And we, we meditated on that verse that God does not delight in judgment. It's, it's foreign to him. He, it's not like he gets, he gets giddy about punishing. He's by nature gentle and lowly. So we see that not only are we liberated and free from the curse, free from condemnation, in verse 14, Paul goes on to further describe and summarize what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Look at verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Because of what Christ did on the cross, the blessing of Abraham comes to the Gentiles. What's that? Go back a couple weeks ago to when we were studying this. It's salvation. Salvation to all the nations. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. It's having the Holy Spirit dwell within you. You remember the situation? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The situation in the Old Testament. If you were, if you were a, a member of the covenant, if you were a part of the people of God, you did not have the Holy Spirit within you. If you were a king, you might have had the Holy Spirit within you. If you were a prophet, you had the Holy Spirit within you. If you were specifically a construction worker tasked for like building the temple, building the tabernacle, you had the Holy Spirit within you. And, and we saw from our study that the, the Old Test, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit's indwelling of, of believers was temporary and for a purpose. That all changes in the New Testament. And that's why Paul makes such a big deal about this in verse 14. Here in the new covenant, we have received the promised spirit through faith. Unlike Old Testament believers, you and I have the privilege of having the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And it doesn't matter if you're a king or a prophet or a construction worker. Men and women, adults and kids, all believers have the Holy Spirit dwelling within. This is the beauty and privilege of the new covenant. Here at the end here, New Testament scholar Thomas Schreiner gives this summary of this account, of this passage. Paul is now at the conclusion of his scriptural argument. He maintains that since the Gentiles have the Holy Spirit, they enjoy the blessing of Abraham. And if they enjoy the blessing of Abraham, they are members of Abraham's family. And if they're part of Abraham's family by receiving the Spirit, they do not need to submit to circumcision or the law to become part of the people of God. And that's what we've been arguing all throughout chapter 3. So here's, here's what we've covered today. If we look to the law for the ground of our relationship to God, we will only find condemnation. We must look to Jesus alone. We trust not our works, but the work of Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He perfectly obeyed the law. He earned righteousness. And on the cross, our sin was placed on his shoulders and his robe of righteousness was placed on us. We get this robe of righteousness by placing our faith in him. And therein is true freedom. Let's pray. Father, we have seen so clearly from your word this morning that the faith is not of the law. That when it comes to salvation, the law and faith are mutually exclusive. The law doesn't save us. The law exposes us. So Father, if, if there are those still who are unclear about our relationship to the law in salvation, we ask that you would make that clear to them. Father, for those in here who are struggling, as we all do, with harsh thoughts of you, of guilt and anxiety, help us to look to the cross and find our freedom there. Help us to look to the cross and see displayed for us your love, to see justice, to see it all there on the cross. Father, help us to, to, to not... Think of you as one who is a tyrant who's just wanting to crush us, but Father, one who sent his son to the world to save us.
So Father, help us to be a gospel people. Help us to be a people who find freedom and joy in the work of Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen.